Welcome back to the Express at the Vancouver Art Gallery for our special on the city's 125th. Now what can Fu tell us about history? Actually quite a lot. Fu's Ho Ho may be the last old style Chinese restaurant in Chinatown, but neither the dishes nor the stories have been lost. Tucked away on the western edge of Vancouver's Chinatown, Fu's Ho Ho's neon lights still glow. For decades, this little chop suey house has been serving Chinese Canadian classics like chow mein and egg foo young. This is the last real old style Chinese restaurant left in Vancouver's Chinatown. And um, what's so interesting about the food is that the food that we serve here goes back over 100 years. Back to the gold rush days of the 1800s when tens of thousands of Chinese came to Canada in hopes of striking it rich. Many, however, ended up doing back-breaking labor. But they overcame the hardships, eventually settling down in cities and towns all over British Columbia, setting up shops and restaurants. After the turn of the century when the railroad was built, there were a lot of cafes built outside of, in, in the countryside. And many were owned by Chinese. And they were starting to, they originally started just with steaks and bacon and eggs and all that. And they slowly started adding dishes. Dishes from their homeland. That's what the original Ho-Ho's did back in the 1920s. But in the 90s, it closed down. So current owner Joanne Sam and her husband took it over, adding the foos but keeping the uniquely Chinese-Canadian recipes. Papier pork, Chinese pork. It's, it's, I'm going to spare the onion and uh, pork. We're going to call it Canadianized food. It's at least five, six, seven, eight generations old. Um, some of the dishes have lineages because, I mean, chop suey and egg foo young, those dishes are not part of Chinese cuisine. These are very much, you know, North American, Asian, or, you know, Chinese food as we call it, it's Canadianized food. But Foo's is about more than just food. Back in the day, restaurants like these were like community centers for Chinese during a time of discrimination and segregation. It's really hard to even live outside of Chinatown. You weren't allowed to buy property, so it, it had its own sort of like self-imposed isolation. Today, Joanne is still cooking, keeping these Chinese-Canadian traditions alive. But in Vancouver, with an ever-growing number of culinary choices, it's getting harder and harder to keep these neon lights on. All the more reason, Jim says, to savor the old-style flavors at Foo's. I'm Tim Chung in Chinatown for The Express. One of Fu's biggest fans is local TV legend Red Robinson. He actually has his very own booth at the back of the restaurant. You're watching our Express special on Vancouver's 125th. One of the signatures of our city, the many and massive murals. And in honor of the big birthday, the city is planning the biggest mural in all of Western Canada. It's 125 feet across. So every square here is a two foot square on the wall. When the Vancouver Native Housing wanted to do a mural on their building, I looked at the wall and I thought, wow, that's 7,600 square feet. We're talking swing stages. We're talking a very short period of time to get funding together, artists together. So you guys moved the swing stage like five, yeah, times. five times. Richard Tetro's name was immediately on the list. There's Cree backgrounds represented here in the TV. Richard's called East Vancouver home for over 30 years. Here in his studio, the concept for the mural came together. I had a lot of logistical challenges to it. Um, it's the first mural that I'd done that really required a very schematic approach in that we had to work off a swing stage and because it's six stories high. There's no spray paint on this wall. Richard's murals are done the traditional way with a paintbrush. The theme that we've been working on is the idea of migration and using crows. With help from his good friend Jerry and other artists around the city, the Through the Eye of the Raven mural took six weeks to complete. We have the largest mural yet coming this summer. Richard and Jerry, along with other artists, will collaborate again this summer for the city's 125th anniversary. For the centennial, it was a call for submissions, and so I put in a proposal in conjunction with Britannia Community Services. The idea that's come out is something to do with flight, and possibly to do with migration of crows. 
We've got 10 projects. All of them are different. They're all different parts of the city. Richard says he prefers to work on a large scale. Well, I think that there's a great receptivity to murals and to the vision that murals, and particularly the murals that come out of the community, can express about the community. I think that they bring a human kind of personal touch to it and you know the fact that people have spent hours and sometimes hundreds and hundreds of hours in designing and conceptualizing something shows a real care and respect for the community and I think that that's something that's really needed and in the downtown east side it's a, it's a big thing. In Vancouver, I'm Melanie Panetta for The Express. The mural is expected to be complete in March 2012. And if you'd like to take a look at the other 50 plus murals that Richard has done in our beautiful city, you can go to his website. Now you're watching our express special on Vancouver's 125th. And we're going to take a look back and a look forward up next. After the break, SFU's new daycare development. It's designed to open up completely as though it's a glass box and allow children in and out of that outdoor experience. They let me have the rooms for $65 a month. The Lee Building's living history. You remembered a lot from when, when we were together. The Express. This is your local voice. Community programming on Shaw has been generously sponsored in part by... Hairstyling and color services for Shaw TV. Provided by The Lounge Hair Studio. Loungehairstudio.com Welcome back to the Express at the Vancouver Art Gallery for We Vancouver, 12 Manifestos of the City. This is also part of our special about Vancouver's 125th, um, but you guys are really looking forward, not backwards. That's right, yes. We're, we're looking at building some of the most uh, expressive and interesting buildings in the Lower Mainland and learn how sustainability can move us forward. Now tell us who the three teachers are in daycare and how that relates to the building. So we have the normal child care provider, then we embrace the parent. So the parent is supposed to come in and interact with their child before and after the daycare experience so they understand what their kid really did in that day. And then the final teacher is the most important one and that's the environment. So the daycare facility that we're building is designed to open up completely as though it's a glass box and allow children in and out of that outdoor experience so that the outside becomes the inside, the inside becomes the outside. It's such a cool concept and I love to um, incorporating the natural world with what you guys are building there which seems so very Vancouver and so very yes. BC. Yes, and very SFU. As, as we all know, SFU is up on top of the mountaintop. There's several hundred acres of conservation area surrounding us. So we thought it was important rather than in the, in the outdoor play area, instead of sticking down sort of typical pieces of plastic that you see in all these other play environments, that we would hire local artists and have them craft things like the willow huts that you see over here so that children are playing with things that came right out of the environment themselves. You know what makes me feel? I want to go back to school again. Does that mean I have to have a kid? Well, you either have to have a kid or you have to turn five again. Okay, I like that option. <laughs> Oh, to be five again. The plan is for the University Child Care Centre to be complete in the fall of this year. Now, from plans of a new building to tales from an old one. A local woman's grandfather built the Lee Building back in 1912. And as she was exploring the history of the building, she found a woman who's even older than it. The Lee Building on Broadway and Main has been around since 1912, but one of its former residents is at 99, just slightly older than the building itself. The building was completed in October, I understand. I was born in March, so a couple months older. Today, Doris is visiting the building she lived in for decades. I moved in here in November 1st of 1963. Doris lived here until 2007. 44 years. You remembered a lot from when we, when we were together, too. Doris is meeting with Tracy Forsythe. This building was built by her grandfather, Herbert Lee. 
This is a picture of my grandparents. This is Herbert Lee. This is Beatrice, my grandmother. Tracy never had the chance to meet Herbert Lee, but she's been researching the building at the archives and talking to former tenants who knew her grandparents. My part in this is to attain residents who lived here as far back as we can go. I have in an email that came to me a resident who lived here in 1936 to 44. And that I found particularly uh, amazing because that person told me that my grandmother had canaries. And that's something I did not know. Tracy learned there are still features of the building that have not changed since 1912. We're standing in the boiler room of the Lee building. And these are the original boilers, this one and that one from 1912. This brick here is, I mean, the whole thing is just, it's stunning. We're standing in the original elevator room of the Lee building, and this equipment dates back to the early 1900s. Fast forward half a decade, and Doris was just getting settled in. I uh, love the old building, the marble walls, the stairway, and uh, the chandeliers. And they let me have the rooms for $65 a month. Doris says times have changed in Vancouver since she arrived in the 1940s. It was quite different to what it is now. They had streetcars. You didn't have to pay a fine if we jaywalked across the street. The history that is part of older people's knowledge is just incredible. I mean, you need to take it, now you need to take it while it's here. Tracy's grandparents lost the building during the Depression, but she's committed to celebrating its centennial next year. We've been talking about it for a few months now, and I've connected with a board member, and we're organizing this uh, event for next year. I think it's really important to uh, Vancouver to conserve as much heritage as they can and to take care of what we have that's left that uh, reminds us of our heritage. And as for Doris, well, she'll be the guest of honor at next year's centennial and celebrating her own. It's been quite a life. <laughs> it's been quite a life. I'm Bianca Salterbeck in Vancouver for The Express. If you'd like to learn more about Tracy's efforts and her plans for the Lee Building Centennial celebrations next year, you can go to her website. And how about celebrations for Vancouver's 125th? That's where we're shining today's Express Spotlight. The Birthday Live celebration begins with a street hockey tournament and continues until 10 p.m. with a giant birthday cake, video art, and special performances from 5440 and more. We Are The People commemorates 125 years of laughter and tears in the downtown east side, the historical heart of our city. Celebrate Vancouver at the Vancouver Cherry Blossom Festival. This engaging festival provides a happy occasion to bring people together in our city's beautiful natural park settings to experience a miracle of nature. And on April 9th, here at the Art Gallery, they're hosting a day-long conference, Sustain Vancouver, that looks at how different models of culture and ecology shape our city. It's part of the current exhibit, 12 Manifestos of the City, that runs until May 1st. Now that's it for today's Express. Happy birthday, Vancouver, and we'll see you next time.